and welcome to UFO Warning. In this episode we're talking about UFO abductions. Specifically this one comes to us from UFO Insight. The title of the article is The Copley Woods Incident, Abduction or Supernatural Events. It goes on and says the events of June 1983 are largely regarded to be a case of alien abduction, but is one of those encounters that strays slightly into the supernatural field and until an explanation is reached, it is likely to be of interest to both groups. It goes on and says, The incident was investigated by several researchers, perhaps most notably Bud Hopkins, whose research would result in the book Intruders, The Incredible Visitation at Copley Woods, as his investigation continued long after the book was available, more and more information became available. It would seem whatever was behind the events in the summer of 1983 in Indiana, they were likely just one in a timeline of strange incidents over several years. Before we look at this case a little more detail, uh, check out the video below it says, and then it has a video you can watch on Bud Hopkins, which is quite interesting. I highly recommend you go to the website and take a look at it, where uh, he's talking about uh, Uf UFO abductees. And, but then the article continues, it says, at the time of the incident on the 30th of June, 1983, Debbie Jordan Cobble was living with her two small sons at her parents' home. On this particular evening at around 6 p.m., after eating what was left from a bucket of takeout chicken, Debbie stood at the kitchen sink washing her hands, free from the grease of the food. She was due at a neighbor's home so she could, not <clears throat> so she could cut patterns out for a costume, a service which was her source of income. It was... <clears throat> It was as she moved her hands under the running water from the kitchen tap that she first noticed the bizarre bright light. It was coming from the pump house of the swimming pool in the backyard. Of even more concern to Debbie, the pump house was locked. She had locked it herself only hours earlier after replacing the chlorine tablets for the pool water. She would ask her mother to look at the light, which she said was strange but nothing of concern. Besides she, besides, she assured her daughter she would lock the doors after she set off to the neighbors. Now, I just want to interject here. Sometimes in these multiple sightings like this, we do have strange reactions from other people. You have the main character who is the abductee sometimes, or the experiencer, and you have another person involved. The two people can be looking at the same thing and maybe not see the same thing. Or in this case... The mother sees this bright light emanating from the pool house where there shouldn't be a bright light. You know, obviously she should have been concerned, but she has uh, just the opposite of reaction, like, oh, don't worry about it. It's almost like this uh, helplessness or this detachment from the situation. And we see that sometimes in these situations where there are two or more people uh, at the scene and one of them is abducted, but the other one's not. One person experiences the entire abduction and the other person, even in the middle of it, uh, just doesn't seem to register the facts. They seem detached from the reality of what's going on around them. And that's what I sense is what has, what's happening right here. It goes on, it says, Besides, she assured her daughter she would lock the doors after she left for the neighbors. A lot of good that would do, huh? Not entirely convinced, Debbie set off anyway. By the time she approached her car, a quick look toward, towards the back of the house revealed the light was no longer there. She quickly ran to the door to check. To check it, it was as if she had locked. As if she had thought she'd locked, she ran back to her vehicle and set off the short distance to the neighbors. Upon arriving, she kindly asked if she could use the phone to check on her mother. Once again, she assured Debbie she was fine. However, almost immediately after hanging up, the neighbor's phone rang. It was her mother. This time, fright gripped her voice. She wanted Debbie to come home now. It says, shortly after Debbie had left her mother, had left, her mother had gone about tidying the kitchen of that evening's supper. After she was, after she was doing so, she noticed a basketball-sized ball of light in the backyard. It seemed to hover near the bird feeder. She at first thought someone was playing with the flashlight. However, as she watched the soft light, it began to decrease in size. So much so, it soon appeared completely. It soon disappeared completely. Then, for reasons she couldn't explain, she had an uncontrollable urge to contact her daughter to come home. Well, to me, it's almost as if this—I um, don't know how you'd even call it—it it was almost like she was under some kind of thought control. To begin with, she sees this light 
that her daughter's concerned about in, in this back uh, building behind the house where there shouldn't be a light. She should have been concerned, but she wasn't concerned. In fact, she tells her daughter, just go on ahead, you'll be fine. But then after a little while, she becomes concerned and calls her daughter. It's almost as if this... Uh, is as if this this cloud of not caring is just lifted off of her, as if she was under some kind of mind control, and now she's come out from under that control. It goes on and says, given the amount of time between Debbie calling her mother and then re- and then receiving the panic phone call, only moments later, the events witnessed at the family home must have must have been only seconds in length. Well, probably a couple minutes. It says Debbie apologized to the neighbors and promised to contact them. When she knew what the problem was, when she arrived back at her parents' home, she entered the property and went straight to where her father kept his gun. Although there was no ammunition in it, she reasoned with her mother, whoever is out there doesn't know that. Now here you go again. You have people trying to uh, approach these uh, very strange, it's either extraterrestrial or paranormal event, with a firearm. And I'm pretty sure that a firearm is not going to do you any good against either a spaceship or a ghost. And while we're talking about that, that's what just that's the one problem I have with the History Channel series on Skinwalker Ranch. Um, they have that guy walking around carrying a shotgun all the time. He's more likely to hurt himself or somebody else there with that shotgun than he is to bring down a UFO or uh, take out a take take out a Skinwalker. I just think it's I think it's just silliness to even bring that uh, into the situation. In fact, if you were approached by by one of these uh, extraterrestrial things, probably the last thing you'd want to do is take a shot at it. I, they made it all the way here from somewhere, so I'm guessing whatever the technology they would have at their disposal would make a simple shotgun or rifle of ours uh, look like a toothpick. And then it goes on, it says, perhaps even more concerned Perhaps they even more concerned. Her mother not only couldn't remember why she wanted her daughter to return home, she couldn't even remember calling her. Incidentally, her memory of the call returned several weeks later. That does sound like she's been exposed to some sort of energy field or something where she's really having a problem uh, holding any kind of train of thought. It goes on and says, Debbie cautiously walked outside and approached the pump house. Opening the door, she looked inside, pointing the gun in front of her so anyone inside could see it. Clearly, there was nobody there. She then went over to the side garage. On her way to the outbuilding, she could see the family dog who was wedged under her father's truck. It was extremely agitated and making it obvious it didn't wish to be approached. She stood, leaving the dog alone, and headed toward the garage. She pushed open the door and looked around quickly. It was completely empty and lifeless. However, she began to feel a burning sensation all over her body. She would write two decades later, it was like I was covered in acid. That's almost like maybe she was exposed to some kind of radiation. Possibly. It says a sudden urge rushed through her, telling her to leave the building right then. She turned to leave. Before she could do so, however, something very bright and electrifying, hit her squarely in the chest. She would describe it as if she were punched by a huge electric fist, which soon forced a burning sensation all over her body. She believed she could feel every molecule of my body vibrating, and she says, and was paralyzed. In those moments, she believed she was dead. Although it felt like minutes, Debbie believed the incident lasted only seconds. Slowly, the vibrating and the burning sensation subsided, a movement returned to her limbs. She couldn't have she she didn't have full use of her eyes though, experiencing huge blind spots due to the brightness of the light. It was then an intense stabbing, burning pain filled her ear. And with it came the words as if an invisible entity was talking directly to her mind that it was unfortunate she had to feel pain. Now this is another one of these strained conversational tones these things take. Which leads me to believe sometimes that maybe these things are just artificial intelligence. That it's almost as if they have no emotional intelligence. And like we talked about before, you know, it can be the the smartest computer in the world, but the human the humankind still has the greatest emotional intelligence of any creature on any creature or any entity on this planet. That's the way God made us to have emotional intelligence. And this comment that was unfortunate. 
It was like the cl this thing has no empathy. You can see it right here. It has no empathy. It's just drawing up this word to somehow calm her a little bit, maybe. The next thing she knew, she lay on the ground near the outbuilding doorway. She had no idea how much time had passed or how she had arrived there. In, f in front and above her, around five feet in the air, hovered a small ball of hovered a ball of light. It was basketball shaped, but then morphed into an egg shape. After several moments, it vanished from sight. It was then that another shimmering egg-shaped light came into focus, around ten feet in diameter near the pump house of the pool. Even more bizarre, she could see a humanoid sil silhouettes in front of her. She tried to count them, six in total. They appeared to line up and slide into the oval-shaped light, vanishing into it. She wasn't sure if it was perspective or not, but the figures appeared to have larger heads than their bodies dictated they should. Now, uh, and this this lady, she also, uh, uh, if you watch the video that they recommend here, she was one of the first to draw uh, these aliens that we now describe as greys. She was one of the very first people to do that. The next thing she knew, she could hear someone say, It's over. There was nobody there. But her memories of the events came flooding back. She suddenly thought about her children. Strangely, a voice spoke inside her head, assuring her that they were okay. Then she arrived back at the main house. She ran inside to find her mother, stood there, looking outward in a daze. Only then Debbie called out to her. Did she seem instant, seem to instantly snap out of the bizarre trance-like state? It's, like, it's as if her mother was hypnotized, really. She decided to return to the neighbor's home, thinking... As bizarre as the incident had been, there would be an explanation for it. When she arrived, she was missing for around 15 minutes. Her worried neighbor informed her she had left their home over two hours ago. It wouldn't be the only incident of missing time that evening. Being of a similar age, Debbie, Debbie exhausted and confused, asked if her neighbor wished to go for a swim at her parents' pool. It was just after 8 p.m. and still warm. Debbie would... Debbie would sew the patterns in the morning. She and her neighbor and her teenage daughter made their way to Debbie's parents' home. As they were making their way to the pool, however, the flashlights of Debbie's father's truck shined in the driveway, announcing his arrival from work. Debbie checked her watch and realized the time was suddenly 10 minutes after 11. Somehow, they had lost three hours of time. So here this poor lady has been abducted, obviously, and she's missing for two hours. She returns to her neighbor's house. She fetches her neighbor. They walk over toward the pool. And before you know it, they realize that they've been missing for three hours. Deciding not to say anything, Debbie led her neighbor to the pool. As they stepped toward the water, though, the young girl let out a gasp of pain. She claimed that she had stood on something hot, which had burned her foot. By the time all three of them were in the water, the teenager claimed her entire leg was numb. Shortly after... All three began to feel an intense and sudden nausea, as well as sore eyes and fuzzy vision. They decided to call a night, and each went to their own beds. The following day, though, upon waking, Debbie, upon waking, Debbie couldn't open her eyes. They were so swollen. Upon seeing a doctor, he would liken the injury to someone who had been welding without a mask. Now, that's something we hear repeatedly in these abduction stories, where people have burns or injuries to their eyes, that are likened to welding burns when they're exposed to this bright light. This should show you the nature of whatever it is that's abducting these people. Whatever it is, is not uh, some happy pie in the sky, we're here to help clan. It is some kind of entity that that is without empathy. It says, it goes on and says, Upon seeing a doctor, he would then liken the injury to someone who had been welding without a mask. Specialist creams and liquid drops would eventually decrease the swelling, but it would take several weeks for them to return to normal. However, Debbie would continue to be extra sensitive to bright light for the rest of her life. She would also experience sudden flare-ups of burning sensations to her eyes on occasion. Lost in the initial incidents was the eventual discovery around a week later of an eight-foot circle in the grass of the yard. There was also a 20-foot swath, which ended in a perfect arc next to it. 
The grass was brown and dead inside the circle, as well as the ground itself being gray and cracked. As she started, <clears throat> as she stared at it and heard, and heard her mother state, "That is where the UFO landed." All her memories of that evening would flood back with even more clarity. So it sounds like her mother was even beginning to recover memories of this UFO. This, this, uh, this is what's so. You know, it's strange, but to me, it's also believable. Believable because it's it's a common uh, thread that runs through these abduction stories. Incidentally, the circular mark would remain there for several years. No grass would grow over this mysterious this mysterious area, and when it snowed, the snow would quickly melt away from this part of the yard. One thing that did grow, though, was dandelions, which Debbie would stare, which would state were three times the size of normal ones. Furthermore, no animals, be them pets, wandering cats, or even birds, would step on this now ominous, uh, ominous patch of land. This is, reminds me, I think it was in Kansas or Missouri, where there was a UFO observed, and it was I think it was grandparents and a grandkid lived there, and it left a uh, patch in the yard. It seems like uh, there was something about the dirt, how it was glowing. Debbie herself would suffer from a wide range of health problems in the years following the incident. These ranged from rashes, headaches, and problems with her teeth to light to life-threatening allergies she previously hadn't had. As would the family's d- dog, who would unfortunately pass away only months afterward. A vet examined the animal and said and stated it appeared as though it was 20 years old instead of six. Wow! As word spread about Debbie's experience, and when more and more paranormal and UFO investigators arrived at the family home, several corroborating witnesses would come forward. Several of the neighbors, for example, would state would state to having seen strange balls of light on the night in question. Some of them in, inside of their homes. One neighbor would even state they had witnessed hundreds of strange balls of white dancing and floating around the Copley Woods in the night of the incident. Now this is odd too because we you know we've had and just in the last couple of years we've had lots of reports of these uh, orbs of light, sometimes white. Uh, I personally have seen them myself where they at least on one instant where they were orange, and the, the silly thing just uh, was I don't know hovering around maybe 20, 30 foot off the ground and just and just drifted off like it was balloons. It was a nighttime. These whether they're ball lightning or some natural phenomena, or in this case. Uh, it could be extraterrestrial or paranormal. We don't know, but they are definitely have been observed by people, and some of them even filmed. Just what happened that summer's night in 1983 in Indiana will likely remain a mystery, it says. Was it a case of alien abduction, and if so, was Debbie the only abductee, or might, we, or might there have been some kind of mass event? Remember, several neighbors would eventually report activity in their homes that evening, perhaps Perhaps they had forgotten this such instance until Debbie's account re- released the previously suppressed memories. And what of the hundreds of balls in the woods? Is this another sign of mass abduction? And then it goes on and says, or might that, or might that the incident have been some kind of supernatural uh, interdimensional encounter, one which perhaps distorted time instead of wiping memories of it? Well, that's all possible. A very interesting article. I would go on to say. Uh, there's more to the story with Debbie. Um, you can there is a YouTube video floating around out there. She actually uh, believed that she had been uh, impregnated by aliens and experienced that she had and and in her uh, in in her video with uh, Bud Hopkins, she talks about the fact that she had been abducted multiple times from the time she was a little kid until you know I suppose she was in her thirties or forties and she described how she. Uh, believed that she was uh, pregnant by, I think it was her fiancé or her husband, and then uh, she realized that she wasn't pregnant, and during one of the abductions, uh, she was actually shown uh, an entity that, that she was informed was uh, her her daughter, which was half human, half alien. I know that really gets out there a long ways, but there is a lot of concern about why are they abducting people, you know? And it wouldn't be the first story that we've heard about uh, aliens trying to keep, trying to create some type of uh, hybrid uh, creature, a mix between the humans and aliens. Uh, 
whether that's aliens or whether that's some other kind of paranormal being, I don't know. But, you know, you could even go back into the Old Testament in Genesis 6, and it talks about uh, the sons of God coming down to man. And there's a whole theory on that, whether these were some sorts of fallen angels or some sorts of, you know, uh, supernatural creatures that interbred with humans and what that all meant. But this idea that humans have been interbred uh, with aliens, it's not just found in the Bible. I mean, it's throughout a, a lot of different belief systems, and it comes in through these abduct, these accounts. So you have to ask yourself if, if there isn't something to this. What I also find interesting about this with case with Debbie was she she's one of these lifelong abductees. She's one of these people that they keep coming back for time and time again. So you wonder if it's uh, something peculiar about her DNA that they're after. Uh, is she just <clears throat> seems like she is a, a personality type, a physical type? Is it, what what makes her special that they want to keep coming back and abducting her? And you find that story a lot with these people. It seems like it seems more often than not, if you read an abductee story. They've been abducted repeatedly that they've had that experience. And to me, that would just be terrorizing. But anyway, this is a story of Copley Woods. And you can find that on UFOinsight.com. Just a, just a great article. Until next time, this is UFO Warning. Over and out.